For those of you who don't know me or the ENA, my name is Randolph. I'm Director of Innovation at the Energy Networks Association, and we represent the gas and electricity networks in the UK and Ireland. So we effectively represent the wires and pipes. Uh, just in terms of housekeeping, uh, if you can stay on mute um, to avoid all background noise, that would be greatly appreciated. There will be a Q&A session later, so please make sure that you answer or ask all your questions in the chat box on WebEx in the bottom right hand corner. And also before anyone else asks, we will be sharing the slides and a recording of the session with all participants. Session afterwards. Uh, 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 getting quite a bit of background noise there. Yeah, quite a bit of background noise there. Uh, okay, that sounds a bit better. Um, so just in terms of the agenda, if we could go back, just back to the agenda for a second. Um, so, first of all, we're going to have a keynote speech from Chi Onwara, who's the MP for Newcastle, Pontine Central, and who we are delighted to have here today. I'm then going to give a short overview of our Open Networks project, and then I'm going to be handing the floor to Laura Sands, who's CEO of Challenging Ideas, who will first give us an overview of the Recosting Energy project that she's been leading followed by a panel session with three key players in the residential flexibility space. So this is where we'll then answer your questions and again, encourage you to ask those questions in the chat box throughout the initial presentation. So in terms of our, our keynote address today, we're gonna to hear from Chi Onwara, as I said. She's currently Shadow Science Research and Digital Minister. She has a key interest in energy, having been on a range of energy, technology and innovation focus committees, and also serving as the former Shadow Energy Minister. Uh, more importantly, from an ENA perspective and, and certainly from my own personal perspective, she is a fellow electrical engineer, which is fantastic and, and really aligns well to what we'll be talking about today. So it's great to have you here today, Chi. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over the virtual mic to you now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh, so much and uh, thanks so much for inviting me to speak uh, today. Uh, um, it is I'm a, something that I'm very passionate uh, about. Well, um, how are we talking about the content and everything being shared with SDI, um, I, RRC, yeah, just have to start things like Right, I think that's probably everybody else has been muted as well. So um, it's great to it's great to be here making this keynote speech on a topic that is of such huge importance for our country and our planet. And I, I'd like to thank the Energy Network Associations for inviting me to speak today alongside the other fa uh, fantastic speakers and panelists. And I just want to start, and particularly on the eve of the International Day for Women and Girls in STEM that the, the challenge of net zero for our economy and for, you know, specifically for our energy networks is, is something that inspires me, but more importantly, it inspires you know, the next generation of, of engineers. When I listen to young people talking about the climate change cha challenge and how they want to be part of addressing it, you know, that is what can help, we can help transform our, our country's climate change contribution, it can also help transform you know, the diversity of our engineering sector as well. Though we can't wait for the next generation of engineers to be, uh, to, to, to be addressing this challenge. Uh, over the last 40 years, we've learned so much about the process of climate change. Warnings from the IPCC and even bodies like the IMF are that much more needs to be done much faster if we can if we are to keep below two degrees warming by 2050 and the next 10 years are absolutely crucial for meeting our climate global temperature targets across the world millions of people are already suffering from the effects of climate changes lake shrinks rivers flood farmland turned to desert and that is creating conflicts you know in many many regions areas of the world as always, it is the poor and the most marginalised and the most disadvantaged who suffer most. And we can't allow the future to be something that only works for those with the money to move to higher ground. This is an issue of social justice as well as a technical issue. 
uh, understand, I think, increasingly, and I think the change of uh, president in uh, the US has increased our the global level of understanding, um, and we're increasingly aware of what will happen if we don't act. So it is time for real change, and central to that change, I think we all know here, is, re is changing how we consume energy and the sources we get our energy from. And as I'm sure everyone here knows, the energy sector has a long way to go before this carbon neutral. Currently, 73% of global greenhouse gas emissions are counted as coming from energy. And so if we're to tackle climate change, we must learn and encourage the greening of our energy supplies. Research by the Transition Pathway Initiative has found that the sector has been slow in implementing operational and strategic carbon management practices. Since 1965, all the top 20 greenhouse gas contributing companies are energy firms between them responsible for pumping almost 500 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. And only 18% of global energy companies have committed to the below two degrees target. None of them are oil and gas firms. So, bad news. The good news is that progress is, is being made. The energy supply sector was the largest contributor to the decrease in UK carbon dioxide emissions between 2018 and 2019. And projects such as the Zero Carbon Humber project uh, demonstrate positive steps. But there is a lot more to be done, and I believe the UK can be a world leader in the green economy and an inspiration to nations across the world. We led the first carbon-based industrial revolution, well, we're the home of it. You know, we can still uh, lead, be a leading nation in this in in the green industrial revolution. But it does require political action. We did once lead the world in developing, in setting out our carbon uh, targets and developing the technologies to support them. But I think we've fallen behind over the last decade of Conservative-led government. And we've had a lot of promises on green investment. But unfortunately, there is, a, I think, the gap between the rhetoric and the reality. And we are veering even further off track to meet our legal binding net zero targets and I won't go through all the figures and all the different programs which there are but the the, the fact is that we are not having the, uh, the, the the step change that we need to see um, and we don't have a strategy of, to achieve that the, the, our, the shadow business secretary Miraban uh, has pointed out that the current plans do not meet the scale of what is needed and whilst we have you know local authorities, and such as Newcastle City Council, which have very progressive plans to reach net zero by, for example, by 2030, just 20 years earlier than the government's plan. But still, you know, energy accounts for 64% of all Newcastle's um, emissions, um, and um, that that they cannot achieve that with, on their on their own. We need the power, both the powers and resources from from Westminster but we also need change in the industry and the sector. And I think it's important now we talk, we're having this on Zoom in the middle of a pandemic, you know, that building back greener is an important part of building back be better. And we talk, hopefully we're moving into the building back phase of this, of this pandemic crisis, and we need to be targeting investment. We can't go back to business as usual, we need to be targeting investment and support in a way that helps address the climate emergency and puts green energy solutions at the heart of the economy. Uh, and I can't emphasize enough that my view that green transformation is a huge economic opportunity for, you know, for our country. Right? And I first um, started talking about the green industries in, in 2010, was about a fortnight after I've been elected to parliament. And over that, you know, now more than ever, we have the opportunity I think we have, we're getting the political will to introduce a massive mobilization of finance and labor towards decarbonization, leading to a rebuilding of our economy, greening of production and the creation of new jobs in high skill, high work, high productivity in industries. Again, this is an opportunity for us to build a high skill economy and workforce and not, uh, and not a low skill low wage economy is an investment in green energy is investment in jobs and the growing global market and low carbon products means that the UK is well placed to become a world leader in green energy with US, UK workers powering the green industrial revolution. 
and the scale, scale means that there should be no shortage of work in, in the task of greening the economy, whether that means insulating houses or putting on solar, or solar panel technicians. But we do need to have um, a forward direction set from government so that our skills agencies, our, our businesses know that that work is there and it is going to be there for some time to come. And just a, now I try to make a habit of uh, introducing engineering debates into Parliament. I was the first MP to talk about the uh, Internet of Things. And um, I, I, last year I, I held a debate, I called debate on uh, lithium batteries, which is a bit of a hobby horse of mine, but, you know, one of the one of the areas that I studied uh, at university. And I think, you know, we've, we've said we've now got an ambition to uh, end uh, internal combustion and well, engines and hybrid cars will no longer be able to be sold in the UK 14 uh, years from now. And uh, that's a, it's a challenge. So so much of that it's, it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity for the UK automotive sector as tra transport makes up 26% of emissions. And it's and I think when we look at particularly when you look at what the energy grid, the, the electricity grid needs to support, needs to provide. Uh, electric vehicles are both a challenge in terms of what they will consume, but also an opportunity in that it means that every house, uh, every car owning house will have a huge uh, battery um, on its doorstep, uh, literally. Uh, but as part of that, we need to put in place the, the infrastructure to support and uh, recycle uh, lithium batteries on an industrial scale. And again, I'm concerned to see that that uh, certainly we certainly haven't got the recycling facilities in the in the in the in the UK, uh, though uh, though um, that, and that's something that I've been calling for. So to, to close, I think I've tried to give a mix of the the opportunities and the technical and political challenges. You know, we I believe and the Labour Party believes we can harness the opportunities of decarbonising our energy network, but we do need the political will to take the right decisions now. So we need an economic recovery which focuses on confronting the combined challenges of unemployment and the climate crisis, stimulating jobs and growth in every part of the UK. So government bringing forward 30 billion pounds in planned capital investment is what we've called for as part of a rapid stimulus package to support up to 400,000 new clean jobs then accelerating investment in such projects as energy efficiency, offshore wind, electric vehicle charging networks. Now that is like having an, an army, a zero carbon army of apprentices and uh, workers um, um, is rising to the challenge. So our vision of a country's future is one where which smart, sustainable growth is harnessed to improve the lives and well-being of everyone. Economic growth is not and should not be an end in itself. What matters is how that growth is generated and how the rewards are shared. Decarbonizing our energy sector is one of the great challenges of our time with the ideas and the solutions and the energy um, of the sector, you know, supported by the political will, we can rise to the challenge and deliver a COVID recovery with green energy at its heart. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Chi, and, and here, here, I think a lot of us on the call fully agree with what you said. I think the UK is definitely very well placed to become a leader in this space. Uh, you know, with a lot of other countries and interact with a lot of them, and they're all looking to the UK for leadership and guidance. And ju just to echo what Paul has said in the chat, it's absolutely fantastic as well to hear an electrical engineer in Parliament who clearly gets this. So um, thank you once again and, and keep up the fantastic work. Okay, um, so we're going to uh, move to a very short introduction to our Open Networks project. I'm going to present a couple of slides, but before we do, you are going to hopefully hear from some of ENA's furry friends. In the UK, this is how our energy system used to look. Large centralised power sources distributing electricity to all corners of the country. And for a long time, it worked. That is until renewables came along 
and the whole landscape changed. Energy sources in the UK are becoming more varied and distributed, ranging from solar panels on the roof of your house to vast wind farms out at sea, a crucial development in the UK hitting net zero carbon emissions in 2050. That is where the Open Networks project comes in. The Open Networks project is run by us at Energy Networks Association with support from across the energy industry. Together, we are transforming the way our energy networks operate. To manage this new landscape of energy sources, the networks are getting smarter and more dynamic, partly as a result of the transition to distribution system operation, DSO. DSO is local network management, where distributed system operators will have a greater role in managing the network at a local level, allowing the connection of more and more low carbon generation to keep our homes and communities running in the most efficient way possible. And it's working. In 2019, 37.1% of our power came from renewable sources. By 2050, that number is targeted to be 80%. To make sure everyone has a safe and reliable supply of energy, the networks need to balance supply and demand at a national level and manage congestion and constraints at a local level. This can be managed by using flexibility services. Flexibility is everyone chipping in a bit. Imagine a beaver opening and closing their dam to regulate flow and capacity in their local river. When the water level is high, they switch their energy to building their homes. And when the water level is low, they focus back on their dams. We're becoming more beaver-like ourselves. As our system becomes more flexible, networks can use solar panels with battery storage and electric vehicles to manage usage patterns right across the country. Electric vehicle owners tap into cheaper tariffs and could sometimes even get paid to charge their cars on a windy evening when supply is high. And on the other side of the coin, when demand is high, consumers can get rewarded for ramping down their energy usage. This is called demand-side response. Take supermarkets, for example. They can safely turn off their fridges for an hour without anyone noticing, and customers can still buy produce. So they do it when demand is high, like an advert break on Bake Off semi-final. This reduces their costs and makes sure all those vital cups of teas get made. All this happens automatically, with homes and electric vehicles responding to price signals from the network, depending on what's happening. Being coordinated in our energy use and distribution is paving the way for an amazing new era in the UK's power grid. ENA's Open Networks project is leading the way in coordinating the switch to be more beaver-like and reach net zero by 2050. Okay, great. Hopefully everyone was able to hear that successfully. Um, it's it's going to be available on our website and you'll, we're trying to make some of our messaging a bit more accessible. So hopefully that helped with that. So if we can just quickly return to the slide deck, uh, I've got a couple of slides which the beavers mainly covered, but I just want to talk about some of the um, some of the figures that we're seeing at the moment with respect to flexibility. Um, so I think the beavers introduced the challenge, but effectively all of this is this change is being driven by digitalization, decentralization, and decarbonization. And it's having a, a, a big impact now. So we've seen over 30 gigawatts of distributed generation now connected to our distribution networks. And over 85% of that is renewables, mainly wind and solar. Uh, in Q1 last year, at the start of the pandemic, we saw 47% uh, of renewables on the grid, um, which pre presented its own challenges. And we've now got over 350,000 EVs on the road, which maybe by itself is, is not such a big number, but the speed of increase and speed of uptake of EVs uh, is, is really high and it is growing rapidly. Uh, if we could just move on to the next slide, please, Dan. So just to introduce the project, it's effectively looking at, our, it's looking at delivering the smart grid. It's, it's the ENA smart grid project. We've got all of our electricity members involved in it. So we've got all of our distribution networks, as you can see on the right hand side there, and also um, the transmission networks. And we've even now got a joint 
uh, work stream with our sister Gas Goes Green project, looking at whole system solutions and, and, whole, and addressing whole system problems. Uh, the project itself has also been uh, a key part of Bayes and Ofgem's Smart Systems and Flexibility Plan. And um, we're working very closely with government, including them, having them sit on the steering group for the project. If we could move on, please, Dan. So in terms of what flexibility actually is, so as I mentioned, there's a lot of distributed energy resources connecting to the system. And an increasing amount of those are becoming flexible, which we believe is critical to achieving net zero, especially when you've got a significant amount of intermittent resources on the system. So what do we mean by being flexible? Effectively, we mean the ability to control or schedule demand and or generation, i.e. turn it up and turn it down when, when needed or when required. So this flexibility itself can help address local and national energy needs. So for example, it can help uh, reduce the national peak and, and national grid ESO has started procuring services from distributed energy resources to, to do that. But from a local level, from a DNO perspective, we can use cost effective flexibility to relieve local network congestion or constraints, as you saw in the video. We we'll just move on. Thanks, Dan. So what does this mean in reality? So all of our networks have made a flexibility com commitment. What this effectively means is we're going to use cost effective flexibility um, to relieve congestion ahead of traditional network reinforcement. So we're going to procure a service instead of building a cable, for example. Uh, in terms of what this means for the size of the market, last year we had almost two gigawatts tendered out by the six GB DNOs um, at various voltage levels, but that included even uh, procuring services right down at low voltage, so on, on the blocks, for example. Uh, and the, the purpose of the project is to grow these markets, um, help make them more accessible, easier to understand, and put more liquidity into them. There's a bit of background. Just, just go on mute. If you're not on mute, that would be fantastic. And we can also go on to the next slide, please. Um, so in terms of... Uh, the markets, as I said, they're increasing in size, almost two gigawatts going out uh, last year. However, we're not, we're still not procuring all that we need. Uh, on average, ac across the country, we're probably procuring somewhere in the range of 50 to 60 percent of what we need. We're just finalizing those stats at the moment. In some areas, we're getting more than what we need, more than 100 percent. In other areas, we're not getting anywhere near what we need. So we know, we know that we need to increase liquidity in these markets. There's a range of ways that we can do this, including better visibility and ease of access, um, creating standardized contractual terms and working with stakeholders to make those easier to understand and sign up to. We're also going to be aligning those with the ESO services later this year, uh, better reporting and stakeholder engagement. But for the purposes of today's session, we think one of the key areas where we can increase this liquidity is by boosting residential flexibility. So most of the participants at, at the moment in these local markets have been industrial and commercial customers. We're starting to see a little bit of, of residential flex dabble, but to be honest, most of it is, is still INC. So we believe there's huge untapped potential in residential properties particularly as they get more of these distributed energy resources, such as EVs, heat pumps, batteries, et cetera, in their homes and, and small businesses. But there is a range of barriers that exist to those, which I'm sure we'll discuss later today. Um, and just a final note that we also think that, as well as from the commercial side of things, innovation and deep collaboration across government and the industry is absolutely critical to overcoming some of these barriers. So that's just a, a few brief notes on where we are at the moment with the Open Networks project and why we think residential flexibility is so critical. 
Uh, hopefully we'll hear a bit more about that today and hear more about the challenges and how we can over overcome them. So I'm now going to hand over to Laura Sands, who's the CEO of Challenging Ideas, and she's going to chair a panel and first talk about the Recosting Energy Project. So I will hand over to you now, Laura. Thank you so much, Randolph. And I love your beavers, by the way. I think that all the whole video is really, really important in conveying that message. Um, I just wanted to also say great thanks to Chi because um, with your background, Chi, but also uh, your challenge, this is all about net zero. Um, and it's absolutely crucial <clears throat> that we start moving forward on flexibility right the way across the system. Um, I always talk about uh, in the food sector, if you didn't have fridges in people's homes, those supermarkets, our supermarkets would have to be three times the current size because we wouldn't have that ability to create flexibility in our domestic environment for food and we would have to have a much, much greater uh, level of, of production. So it's an absolute fundamental point that we need to build flexibility at every point within the energy sector. So I like, and many people do, talk about the domestic power station. Um, in many ways, what this is, is a sort of conflation of digitalized um, and, uh, assets in people's homes that can generate, that can store, and that can actually dispense. And one looks at those wonderful smart homes and thinks that this is all about the future, but actually we can start seeing this emerging um, in construction um, and in retrofits. So it is an exciting tipping point. Um, in addition, obviously EV cars are absolutely crucial to this particular debate. And together, we start to get an integrated system of flexibility and in many ways ability to um, support and it contribute to the energy system. Next slide. Um, and I just wanted to put in some ways in marrying what um, Chi was saying this into the context of net zero. So in our recosting energy pro program, we've been talking about that, that net zero isn't the consumption model that we've had in the past, which is chuck as much um, energy down the pipes and let the customer consume. Actually, net zero is an optimization, and it is about driving out carbon, rewarding customers, reducing whole system costs, because that's where the costs are going to start to lie much more than just the commodity, and maximize, which is very much a, a network issue, maximize the capacity and unlock that capital. And flexibility is actually at the heart of all of those key optimization drivers. Thank you. And what this actually creates is a new market design. We've got to look at the overall energy system and look to optimize that demand. And that is about getting more from less throughout the whole of the so-called consumer and consumption experience and includes very much um, commodity, but really flexible demand at its heart. So that competitive pressure between optimized demand and optimized supply will start to really drive efficiencies, reduce our carbon intensity, but also reduce overall costs. Thank you. And so through the recosting energy program, we really wanted to calibrate what actually flexibility means in terms of the value to the system. So currently, and we believe this is fundamentally wrong, is we value or we cost the energy system around the levelized cost of the electricity itself. But as we start to get into much more complex um, whole system design, we are going to need to understand the cost to the whole system. And while you might not be able to see it on this chart, it's very exciting what flexibility does. It doesn't just help Randolph and his and his great um, members, but it actually helps the overall cost of the whole system by deploying EVs, 
Um, PV is very important as a self generator. Um, also, heat pumps, also energy efficiency. And these all deliver something crucial, which is an avoided cost to the whole system. And so flexibility sits right at the heart of driving that efficiency. So I'm very excited about these domestic assets. And we calculated through our project that an EV van could deliver up to 500 pounds every year of value to the energy system. That is 500 pounds that is not being spent on a generating asset, not being spent on a genset being fired up. This is something um, that we really need to unlock. But there are lots of challenges. Next slide. And that is, we really do need to consider how are we going to get millions of assets um, into people's homes. For this market to really thrive, we've got to have a much greater deployment. Um, and the Treasury talked about the net zero in their net zero report absolutely pinned it and said that it's liquidity, i.e. access to capital constraints. People are willing to make investments, but they do not, and as we know even more today, have sitting in their bank, you know, £8,000 to put on some solar panels and, and um, some battery storage. So let's be very, very clear. We have got to, in may many ways, make the demand side of our energy system equal to our supply side. And if you continue, and that's why we're proposing that all these markets, all the markets that exist for large scale uh, offshore wind, the solar, et cetera, solar farms, et cetera, is equally accessible to those people, um, for those consumers who want to, in many ways, make such a significant contribution to the energy system, but also save money. However, we do need these mechanisms. It's as a high bar for an individual to buy an EV car or get PV or a heat pump installed as it is for Orsted to put out a um, put, um, put, put an, uh, an offshore wind farm to get the investment. So we must start to be absolutely equal with those things. And I was very pleased to hear that Randolph was talking about standardizing um, flexibility contracts. We absolutely believe there needs to be a flexibility purchase agreement, which absolutely brings to life this flexibility and creates some certainty. Next slide. But how does this work? This works by, for example, a car leasing company. Um, leasing you a car, a nice EV car, with, let's say, for example, 300 miles per week in it, they will then take the responsibility um, of optimizing that car, of entering a, an agreement with the local DNO for flexibility, accessing the micro capacity market payment, reducing the asset costs, and most importantly, always looking for the lowest cost um, of energy um, in, in many ways, in building up those 300 miles per week. This starts to have a massive downward pressure on costs right way through the system. But excitingly for a consumer, what that means is that they're getting a reduced price for their car and very cheap miles. So I throw this to the uh, sector and to those people who I hope are going to be asking questions um, that we need to unlock these assets, we need to build those markets and conflate the technology, the markets, and deep digitalization. So we can start really ensuring that we can get prices to devices, that we can unlock this capacity that's sitting uh, in people's homes, but also ensure that it is done in a fair way, giving access to not just those people with money in the bank. So thank you very much, and I hope we will see lots of questions. So uh, moving on from uh, recosting energy, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, introduce Julian Wiley from Social Energy, who's going to talk to us about actually 
this particular concept in practice, in reality, uh, working for consumers. So thank you, Julian. Thank you, Laura. That's, uh, <clears throat> that's really good. That was talking really about what social energy are doing now. We, we make um, homes domestic intelligent power stations. Um, it's not conceptual. We've been doing this fact for, well, for seven years. And social energy now have unlocked the value for domestic energy storage by using technology to stack multiple revenues automatically. So we benefit uh, both the homes and, and grid symbiotically. Um, sorry, I just look at my slides there. It's, um, it's profitable and a commercial model. And we, we've done this over the last 18 months. We've been deploying product and we've sold 7,000 units people to able to pay. So people have bought these and we are very happy customers. You can see, um, we're validated by Energy Saving Trust to reduce customers' bills by 70%. So it <clears throat> does make it a viable purchase proposition for the customer. The, um, one of the reasons is because we, we realised some of the value comes from being an energy supplier, so uh, avoiding um, Tinuos and Genuos. One of the values being an aggregator and obviously uh, the VPP, the residential AI platform we have, drives the whole system to make this profitability. We're the first customer to pass, uh, to, yes, to win tenders for national grid balancing, uh, both monthly and weekly. And we're doing this through domestic prosumers. If I could have the next slide, please, Dan. Okay, so this shows, um, uh, I think we're quite proud of this. This is happening very often now. This is a recent frequency event and our fleet reacting sub-second to help the, um, the event. Uh, let's have a look. So if I just move on again to the next slide, that's just really to show you the, that we're doing what the big guys can do. Probably this is of interest to people on the, on the webinar. So benefits to networks. While we're making this profitable for a consumer, then it also helps the low voltage network and national grid. So you can see we bring new generation to the grid, which I think is very important with the onset of EVs. So I believe we need two to two and a half times the power that we, the energy that we currently have. And that's got to come from somewhere generating locally with low, with low losses and using on site and then cleverly technology forecasting the usage of each home and forecasting the generation of each home and matching that to grid to optimize both grid and home. Solar switch off doesn't sound a big thing, but the, the future home standard is bringing, I think it's 40% of the footprint has to be solar from next January. And I think if I was in a network now, I'd be thinking we've got a real problem there because at peak, we've got a lot of energy coming on the grid. So we need, well, we need storage, but we also need solar switch off in, in extreme, um, extreme events. Obviously we remove home from a, from a peak and we um, just looking, we're, we're ready as a business. We're all ready for dynamic containment, which I think is an achievement for most, most of our competitors, we need them to get better. We need them to come on. So the sector evolves. Uh, I think the sector needs to be here strongly, but most of them are still conceptual and nobody's really cracked frequency response yet. However, social energy is already for dynamic containment and we will be entering the balancing mechanism later this year. Uh, outage islanding I've mentioned because I think there's a lot of, at the moment, you'll see this is able to pay that are buying the solution. And there's a fantastic model, which I'll touch on in a second for, for social housing and social inclusion. And I do think that for the vulnerable uh, on recent vulnerability webinars, there's a good reason for a battery to actually have islanding. So if there's a, if there is an outage, then you're looking after vulnerable people. 
Next slide, please. So customer benefits. When you look at customer benefits on the face of it, this you'd think this is too good to be true. So this is without any margins. This shows the cost price of a solar system installed in a home. Uh, that's coming down in price. And the lifetime returns are really good. Because it's a fairly new model, then the cost of customer acquisition is quite expensive because the customer is not so aware. Uh, there's reseller margins and, and single installs. But what I think the slide demonstrates is that the, the more com competition comes in the market and more awareness of, of what we're doing, then the more the pickup will be because it is a viable option. Um, next slide, please, Dan. So this is my favorite topic, it's social houses. And if you think of the cost price of the kit of around 5,000 pounds, if it's bought in scale for social housing, then the profitability of that shared between the stakeholders, there's funded models coming in here. And this was what Laura touched on. We need certainty. At the moment, they merch, there's many merchant revenues, uh, and I think Social Energy do a great job of capturing them all, but it's not, it's not easy. I think it would be very good and bring lots of competition in if we could get some longer term contracts. Um, just at the moment, if, so, if we, if a social housing authority bought our kit themselves, they have the ability to lower fuel poverty with their tenants by about 25%. Meet carbon targets in that they become net exporters of green energy. They uh, were actually a net exporter. And they increase the value of the property by 14 SAT points. But crucially, they can gain a long-term revenue and increase yields on that property. And then just retouching on the, um, on the fact of bringing funders in. I think the scale is enough now. There's uh, just a few... A few more things to check, well, regulation-wise, that will bring funding in so you can have third-party-owned models in social housing. So I don't think there's a gap. Uh, Laura had a, I think it was Laura who had the slide of um, the haves and have-nots. I really feel that the have-nots can take full benefit. And I also am an advocate that the flexibility market scores social housing and carbon in the flexibility tenders so just to close off i think i must be coming near my uh my timing um we've done this on a handful of resellers we've got thousands out there with six thousand four hundred trading as a um connected network of sort of solar and battery properties creating uh, i think the uk's largest residential virtual power plant and it's a profitable um, model and it's here now it's not conceptual so I, th I think that's probably me for now and look forward to answering questions thank you very much julian and with great pleasure um look look forward to ben godfrey from um wpd to do his presentation i know they've been very much at the forefront of um the flexibility market Excellent. Thanks, uh, thanks, Laura. Yes, um, uh, so I'm Ben Godfrey. I'm the DSO manager for Western Power Distribution. Um, we operate uh, networks down in the Midlands, uh, Southwest and South Wales, and uh, we have a significant um, offering of uh, flexibility. Um, grab the next slide, please, uh, Dan. Um, we're currently um, seeking uh, around about 240 megawatts worth of flexibility in the first half of this year. And that's to complement um, an existing portfolio of about 440 megawatts worth of flexibility that we have in contract. Uh, you can see our license areas there on the uh, right hand side of the screen. Uh, and that patchwork of yellow is where we're actively managing flexibility across those zones and where we're seeking more flexibility um, uh, to um, uh, enable our network uh, to operate within its limits. Um, and the critical part is um, us as a distribution network operator, we want to provide capacity and uh, the ability to connect people to um, use electricity to, to help them on their decarbonisation journey. And but we want to do that uh, in the most economic and efficient way. And flexibility is such a great potential 
um, in that um, just by providing the right price signals and the right information to people to work um, in harmony um, with the network and, and doing the right thing uh, that the network needs, then we can help uh, lock the peaks and fill in the troughs um, of electricity consumption and really help maximise that capacity that we've already got in, in the network. Um, our network is uh, fit for 14 gigawatts worth of um, demand uh, and we can accommodate that throughout, uh, throughout the whole year. Um, however, um, uh, that's not the way that uh, electricity consumption actually works uh, and we're finding at the moment that it's very much um, centred around particular peaks um, uh, within the year um, that uh, we would really like to try and um, uh, flatten out. Um, so there's plenty of capacity in the networks, but it just needs to be used in a more optimal way. Uh, and price signals for flexibility can do that, and we can really start driving people uh, to do that. Uh, so across uh, WPD, we've implemented um, a, a platform, uh, a, a tool suite called Flexible Power. Um, we've led the way in terms of uh, providing uh, uh, ability for customers to be dispatched and settled through that flexibility. And we're now sharing that across with a number of other DNOs across the, um, the UK to try and achieve standardization. We very much see our role as a DNO in being a kind of B2B provider of flexibility. Uh, and we need to work with um, aggregators, um, suppliers, virtual PowerPoint providers and, and other um, entities uh, that are operating in this space to actually do the final leg um, uh, and uh, wrap up all those um, the abilities of customers to Flex um, uh, to help us uh, run the networks. The next slide um, talks about one of the innovation projects we've looked at, which is uh, Future Flex. And this is really about understanding um, the ability of households, domestic households to Flex and what sort of things that we might need to put in place uh, to be able to achieve that. Um, we have this idea of uh, DSO ready homes, uh, so that is to understanding what the actual fabric of the of the home and what, what uh, devices that are there within the home. So heat pumps, electric vehicles, batteries, that type of thing um, uh, to understand uh, what the ability of that household is to flex. Uh, and then also layer on, on top of that, the uh, commercial offerings um, to allow them to take advantage of that. So it's very much a sort of two pronged approach. So we've developed uh, Sustain H, which is um, a uh, DSO type product that will allow um, uh, people, uh, households to participate in uh, flexibility and provide that up to distribution network operators um, so that we can help manage the networks. And we're using data from trials in order to be able to um, inform how material we think domestic flexibility can be. And also trying to blend this into a way that um, incentivizes low carbon flexibility than uh, perhaps uh, the higher carbon content flexibility that the electricity system has traditionally relied on, such as uh, gas peaking sets. So bundling all this together will allow us to have um, access to flexibility that is both uh, low cost and economic and also low carbon as well. And I think that really is um, a, a key point uh, that we want to try and um, ensure that the flexibility is sustainable from now into the future and will help us um, uh, allow um, the full benefits of decarbonisation to be um, pushed out across the whole of the UK and, and run it in a way that um, will allow us to meet the 2050 target that everyone is signed on to now. Excellent. Um, I think that's about me from, from my time um, and uh, happy Thanks. to hand back. Thank you, Ben. And no doubt people will, will ask some of the questions around how the market works, etc. So please do uh, bring on your questions. And really looking at smart transportation in, in reality, it's great to have Fraser Crichton from Dundee City Council, um, a city I know very well, um, who has actually been driving quite an exciting project um, that is wants to make Dundee Europe's most visionary EV city. So, Fraser, thank you very much. Thank you, Laura, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to think, like to say that we are we were voted the most visionary city. So that, that's the trophy that we've got in that picture there. Um, so I'm going to be very quick um, um, through this because I, I, I can see lots of questions. So if we just move on to the next next slide. Um, this is just a quick background of, of transportation of, um, in Dundee City Council. I started this nearly 10 years ago uh, as the local authority 
um, vehicles, and it quickly moved on to um, the whole city, um, as you'll see on the infrastructure uh, very shortly. But uh, just to highlight a few things, we are now sit at, uh, on a council fleet. Twenty three percent of the vehicles are electric. Uh, I've committed to the end of twenty twenty two to have all car, all other cars, small vans, and medium vans. That's roughly about four hundred and eighty vehicles will all be electric, um, which is now less than two years. Um, and now we've moved on uh, to much larger, as you can see down there on the left hand side, we've moved on to um, bin lorries. So I've got the first two, I've ordered another four, I've got sweepers, large sweepers, etc. And again, I've committed to the, within the next um, eight to nine years, all 36 bin lorries will be electric. Um, on the business side of it um and and taxis uh, 20 actually i looked at it the other day i think it's 23.9 percent of the taxis in dundee are pure electric um we have businesses uh also such as um delivery food delivery companies especially during lockdown they've increased to about 50 um vehicles in a, a delivery company and the public as well as you can see um dundee's lorraine kelly there she, um that's now sitting at roughly about three, four percent and increasing, as was pointed out earlier, a rapid rate. Um, what does this really mean? Um, uh, what I used to do was just buy vehicles, but if you look at the next slide, what is that? What I had to create is infrastructure for all these vehicles. So what you can see here is all the different ones. The one that a lot of people know about in Dundee, which is the bottom left one which is uh, uh, one of uh, three hubs. We're in the process of building a fourth hub in the city, which is um, charging infrastructure um, tailored for not just the public, but also for the taxi industry, which is a major polluter in the city. Um, and what you see there is there's six 50 kilowatt rapid chargers, um, on general four 22 kilowatt chargers for slower charging, um, all um, uh, established renewables. The solar on top of it creates roughly about 45 um, kilowatts, um, and that is uh, supplies on the very left-hand side there. It supplies second-hand uh, battery rental, um, batteries in the container there, um, and it stores there. And obviously, at that rate, and you get all the charging. So I've just said it's actually only it's peak shaving, but obviously it's the concept. Um, and to understand the sort of usage, the three hubs um, before lockdown were about 130,000 charging sessions a year. So about 15 times a day, those rapid charges were getting used. Um, on the top left, you see, which is our multi-storey car parks, which is for obviously for the public in the outer ring of the city centre. And uniquely what that is there again, you can see the solar on top of it. Um, but the chargers there are uh, dynamic loaded chargers. So even if uh, if we get a multitude of cars in there, if we have say for I would say 40 cars coming there, obviously the solar is there's not enough solar there. So we tend to try and stay away from the grid as much as we possibly can. So there, therefore, the charge might be seven kilowatt, but it will be reduced to about two or three kilowatts, depending on how many cars are there because we know those cars are going to be there for a long time. They've come into the city centre to work, um, people to work. So there's eight hours they're going to be there. So we can reduce that charge so that we're always using, your, using renewables. Um, on the um, And that is also, that feeds a Tesla uh, wall unit, battery storage wall unit. So if there's not enough vehicles there for argument's sake, then the, the lighting and the barrier system for those multi-storey car parks, um, that's where the energy goes. So we're always... Um, looking to different ways of, of utilising energy from the sun. On the top right is the one that's the new hub, the HUV hub, which has actually got 150 kilowatt chargers there for the, the bin lorries that um, I showed you earlier. Now, again, this is, you know, for me, um, vehicles and the hardware for this are not the key. I was probably, you know, this um, for this whole uh, webinar today is the energy. Where is that energy coming from? So on that side, I'm putting solar on top of the, all the workshops here. I'm putting it on top of the, the all the buildings to feed it. It's going to be 150 kilowatts of solar that's going to feed those um, bin lorries. Um, and 
Uh, um, so obviously that's again a key a key factor. And again, if there's not enough charging going on, the power would go into the the buildings that support that that uh, service. Uh, the last one there is the pop up chargers that we've just been putting in um, across the city for for residents. Again, there's there's many reasons for doing this that I could talk about, but one of the key things on this webinar is to do with we want. Um, people to look to charge potentially rather stay away from the 50 the rapid charging we want it to be slower the charge on three four five kilowatts um and and we see pop residential pop-up chargers uh, as key uh, also 51 percent of the residents of dundee live in tenements so they don't have a driveway um and finally just to kind of um kind of wrap up the last the, the last slide um just shows you uh, that we've got a more the holistic view across the city of using all these different energy sources. So, uh, rather than actually, I always I call vehicles. I do not call them EVs. I call them energy sources on four wheels. That's what they are. The the, the potential to vehicle to grid to get the energy out of the car and back and forward is is huge, and it should be the, what we're looking for the future. And another thing is cycling, walking should come before that. Uh, again, that reduces your electricity, whatever way you look at it. Um, so we're developing many, many projects across the city, all about um, realizing that we're going to need electricity in the future. How do we make sure that it's renewable? What, there's no point in charging up electric cars, running about electric cars if we burnt coal to get there. That's me. Fraser, I think that's very, very exciting, and in many ways driven by a very strong vision, which. Obviously, you've had to uh, play the local politics to ensure that it's consistent and that it's sustainable, because I think what we all feel is that we've got um, some very big challenges, but sometimes the political cycle is too short um, for one to be able to ensure that uh, the investment comes online. So, uh, but thank you very much indeed. Now, we have a whole series of questions that are coming through, um, and I wanted to sort of group them and really ask you to uh, respond from your perspective. But all of you are sort of breaking new ground, and that's very exciting, and really trying to unlock this flexibility at scale. Um, I wonder whether you'd all comment on what, what you have experienced and what you think of the today's barriers and the future barriers, whether they be regulatory, business practice, or in some ways, customer acceptance, um, and what you think the pathway to scale this, because I think what Randolph was very much pointing at is we need significant scale to really unlock these markets. So Fraser, coming to you first, um, <clears throat> I would love to hear about the scars on your back or not. Well, you know what? I'm only 21. Uh, look at the state of me. Um, no, yeah, you, you're totally right. So the, there are many obstacles. I would even say there's many obstacles within a council itself, as you were pointing out there. I mean, um, for, 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 for driving things forward, one of the things that we, I've been very lucky with is political leadership. So um, the classic conversation that I ever have is talking about the leader of the administration. Uh, he, he took away his two um, combustible cars and got a, a second-hand EV, um, and to, and that speaks volumes when your leader is prepared to go and, and lead by example. But certainly, I, I, I think there is a huge um, communication piece to be done here to try and make sure that the, the public are getting that the climate change has got to come, the public are getting that that look, the manufacturer of EVs, but I think we need to tell people why we're doing it, where the benefits are, and on and, 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 and mass. So we've got, a, a, and Dundee, we've got a local media campaign every every month. We have we put into the, the papers, etc. just telling them why we're doing it, where we're going, getting that buy-in. And I think I personally learned that from Norway, and I think that goes for the whole energy sector. We should be telling them that we this is not sustainable where we are just now, and why where we have to go and what we have to do. And I think 
that's a, a major contributor going forward is getting the, the people to buy into this because once you get the people into this, they drive everyone else forward. So I think there, there's a big bit to be talked on that. I think that in many ways, um, you're obviously absolutely right. In many ways, in some ways, Ben also touched on this a little bit. Um, and I'd love to um, explore it a bit more. Obviously, these barriers, but also the fact that maybe we don't always have the most sophisticated intermediaries, the suppliers, the um, who actually understand that firstly, there is value, but also is able to pull together in some ways the team of positions that really unlock this. Yes, um, I, I would uh, agree with that, that sort of uh, premise, Laura. So I, I think we're really at the bottom of um, uh, a very steep curve of uh, implementing flexibility um, uh, across the, uh, the UK electricity system. We um, have uh, very few, very large assets that deliver flexibility at the moment. And I think what we're starting to see is that there's huge potential, particularly for domestic flexibility, from all these low carbon technologies that will be connecting into the future. Uh, and, and our crossover at the moment is really about um, ensuring that there's sufficient mechanisms uh, from a, a both a, a regulatory uh, and um, a uh, and propositions that have been developed through industry to be able to tap into that. Uh, and then as and when those volumes, uh, particularly of domestic flex, start increasing and, and people are willing to participate in those, um, then, um, then that can come online and, and actually start driving down some of the cost of this flexibility. So I think I think what we've seen to date is that um, uh, as a, as a um, kind of industry and, and a, uh, the potential for flexibility to be able to provide these solutions is there, uh, and I don't really think that there's any um, regulatory um, barriers that's preventing us from doing that. Um, it's really about um, uh, uh, technological barriers uh, within the um, uh, domestic um, uh, premise uh, to actually start using that flexibility. And we can see that there is already some new entrants that are um, uh, uh, building on that and able to deliver on that. Um, uh, it just needs to be more, more widespread. Um, we've certainly had some real great success in tapping into flexibility where it is, exists and it can be a, a very firm financial revenue for, for those people. Um, but we, uh, it's not ubiquitous, it's not everywhere on the network and we really need it to be much more embedded. Thank you, Ben. And, and Julian, a lot of people are asking what were the sort of challenges that you found setting up social energy and um, where you feel that there's still friction to actually sort of scale the proposition? You have to come off mute. I could talk a long time on that question, Laura. Um, the Get Rich Quick scheme, uh, so far seven years in, and um, lots of challenges along the way. We set off different to everybody else. We came from a consumer-led, so we were looking to make a consumer buy a product. So we've, I'm very different to anybody on the call in that I'm commercial. And the first thing I look at is how I can make that a viable proposition. And that wasn't easy. It was the technology that made that arrive. I think the things that have hindered, uh, and anybody who's listened to me anywhere before, um, I've always shouted out about certainty. Because if you go to a homeowner or a funder and say, buy this battery, buy this solar, um, you will get the bankable solar revenue, which is quite good. But it's the other revenue stacks that you need to make it viable for the consumer to purchase. And they were very much merchant revenues. Recently, they're becoming more bankable, so that's been moved. Obstacles regarding regulation, I think you touched on. I've been very surprised coming from a different sector how good regu the regulatory boards and um, Ofgem, uh, uh, all the the network operators. For me, everybody is moving in the right direction. That, that's not been an obstacle at all. Um, I think we can get there. The journey is, I think we're on a, the start of the journey. The technology is here and the way to make it happen is collaborations. So 
There's people um, with great hot water technology that they can use for demand side response, the social energy, there's other people out there. And I think licensing technology, licensing to suppliers particularly, so anybody who has decent software, it should be made available quickly to other utilities. We are making ours available. That will bring scale because the cost of acquisition of the customer is the most difficult thing. And sorry, I know I've talked a lot there, but the final thing for me is we've spent 18 months honing that model because we learned lots well with the things we were doing wrong. We now launch in March. We've sold, we've actually sold 7,000 units through a handful of small installers or installers, and there's over a thousand out there. So going out to those thousand, make it collaborations and partnerships, licensing technology with utilities. This can come very, very quickly. So sorry about that for taking the stage. No, well, you, you've absolutely touched on one of my, you know, exciting points, and that is the whole issue around um, the, the technology exists. Um, the markets need to evolve. And in many ways, the digitalization of the system needs to be turbocharged. And if you've got the three key components working together in an effective business model, you start to unlock those things, um, in, in my view. But, but one, one of the things that I'm interested in, what the work we did with recosting was about the whole system costs and this issue of avoided cost to the overall cost of the energy system that we're all going to have to pay for. And I wonder whether all of you look at the revenue stack that you're trying to make, whether actually you're getting enough for your flexibility whether you're being rewarded enough through the system. Julian, I... Um, I think our model is viable because we, we've got sophisticated technology that is forecasting the price of energy, it's forecasting the demand of energy. And I think if we can do it, then all the bigger companies can do it as well. So. It's taken a while. I, I will bang on with the certainty. If you're selling to somebody now in any way, shape or form, the more certainty you can give them for investment, the more they will pick it up. 2020 for me was a year about trying to educate that we exist and the technology is here. 2021, I think people have come back in this short time and the sentiment for green energy and energy saving is suddenly um, it feels like a wave coming our way. So I just think that with these collaborations, the, the market is good. I, I don't have any, obviously if it's better, it will roll out sooner and there'll be more ability to collaborate than because um, the margins will be enough to share them, to share out. Fraser, I just wondered, looking at it from, from your perspective, what consumer benefits, and do you have any issues around, we've been asked about consumer protection, um, to what extent do you see that you can pass those benefits, but also ensure certainty for consumers through the propositions that, that you're in, enabling? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I'm just t touching on a point that, you know, we've not here to make money with and, and, and you're right we're, we're not but the overall picture of what we're trying to do with all the things that i've just shown you in transportation is is there's so many different areas to this there's so many well, well, the example i'll use is someone coming into the city um we from east west and south and just causing gridlock that everybody knows within the city so we, we need a, a price structure within our car parks, et cetera, where we are able, for no other word, to, 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 than manipulate the transportation system using the charging infrastructure, using the energy, so that if we've got a concert in the middle of the city, we can say, go to that car park, the, char the tariffs are practically nothing. If you go to the other one, it's five times it. Um, if, if during the at night time, we're going to create a we've going to create a low emission zone, and not only do we create a low emission zone within the city, we want those vehicles to park in our 
um, the multi-storey car parks at night, and we'll give them a uh, reduced rate as a benefit of moving your vehicles and creating a city that's not just a low emission zone, it has no vehicles in it. So the, there's a huge holistic view of what we're trying to do. And then you've got to understand the energy, the flexibility of where you're now deciding to put it all about. Now, the change in on lockdown has changed everything, as everyone knows, on working practices. So what we used to do would be on our car parks and kind of sticking on this theme is we used to give people a monthly pass and they used to come into the city and had it for a month. What we're going to see is a hybrid going forward, which is people working from home, but still wanting to come into the office for maybe two, three days a week. It's going to be a hybrid. So what we're talking about is offering uh, charging and parking together in the city centre where we want to go and then on a credit system, understand the patterns that people are going to make and then understand the flexibility for the energy and where it is about. So it, it, the whole thing when we're talking about the transportation is how do we sit with this whole e-mobility, change over to e-mobility, how do we incorporate that with the movement of, of within a city, etc. It's a huge project, it's a huge understanding but the energy of it is key, uh, and then the energy of, 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 of that's the whole crux for me of what we're trying to do there on the transportation side. And you've been working closely, obviously, with your network as part of um, the planning, which is great. Now, I'm going to come back to Julian because we've got quite a few questions um, focused around consumer protection. Um, also, the issue about how do we actually um, create the proposition where there is what I would call a, a tenant, a, a sort of landlord stroke um, service provider relationship. And just be very useful to find out more about that. Um, the other thing that I would love also um, you to cover up is this issue about the value of smart meters and how is that changing your business uh, proposition to customers? Okay, so um, thanks, Laura. Three great questions for me there. Um, I, I'll start with the last first, if that's all right. Smart meters. I think we are the only utility that has every single customer with a smart meter because we need a smart meter to be able to settle half hourly. Half hourly. So for us, we love them. Um, maybe they could be a little, little bit better. Smarter. Maybe smarter. <laughs> Well, yeah, I suppose we do that already. So if you were looking at down the line, economies of scale, you'd take one of those meters away and you'd have one very smart meter. At the moment, we have a smart meter and uh, we have our own MID approved, extremely smart and fast meter. So we've no qualms about that. We love smart meters. Um, going back to consumer protection, again, coming from my commercial background, trust pilot is everything. And our business didn't recognize that originally. We were doing nothing wrong. We just weren't educating the consumer. Our CSAT scores, satisfaction scores, are market leading. We've only been a utility for two years and we lead the sector in satisfied customers. We answered the phone, I think, either the quickest or second quickest, even though we're a digital business and our business is consumer centric. One key thing is the way our revenue works is we take a minority share of all the clever, a commission you might say, of all the clever uh, trading and tenders and, and um, cost avoidance. So it's in our interest to reduce the customer's bill. So we have negative customer bills and they are our most profitable customer, which most people on the webinar will be amazed to hear. But our ambition is to have no paying customers because we're make, making more money. And then this, the second, the final question, but your second question, Laura, the landlord proposition. Again, my favorite subject, and I can really talk on this for a long time, but very short version is the utopian scenario that I'd like to get to is the landlord supplies a, a he builds the heat and the energy with the rent. 
And there's the, the best reason for that is you've got one cost to serve mm -hmm. and we deliver energy 70% cheaper. So if the landlord was to reduce the, their energy bill by 20%, and reduce the heating bill and that's a different subject but there's also a saving and maybe add the broadband you'd have the landlord would actually be making a better yield and the tenant would be out, removed out of fuel poverty the model exists um maybe there's some a little bit of regulation to change and i think it's the thinking of the housing associations to pick this model up which we're working on and the second model to that is we can simply have a customer who is a social landlord, sorry, a social tenant, um, whereby the landlord maybe have, have bought the installation, they gain their green target, the carbon target, and the EPC. Um, so there's a, a mix of those, and depending on which housing association you speak to, there's various options. So there's some work to be done on the contracts. But it's a model that will be huge and I think this year you'll see it. We've got quite a few trials going in this year and we're open, opening, opening them up to people to see them. Fantastic. Um, a question I'd like to put to sort of Ben and also to Randolph, which is, um, and maybe is even to myself, which is about how do we construct a sort of nationwide standardized flexibility purchase agreement where the actual relationship creates some longer term sort of almost baseline uh, revenues, which actually starts to unlock these assets, because that seems to me to be the big challenge is we can't get the deployment because the assets are too expensive for so many people to access. But the flexibility purchase agreement would be useful to in some ways democratize the access to to these markets ben would you like to kick off yeah um certainly in terms of um standardization of contracts that's something that open networks um is doing and i'll, I'll leave randolph to expand on that a, a little, little bit more um uh, but what we've seen through uh, uh through flexible power and wpd's offering uh, is that um the uh, DNO uh, provision of um, the revenue stack um, uh, can uh, make a substantial difference to the um, uh, to the business case, um, but there are other, uh, other more substantial um, elements uh, such as um, uh, wholesale price and uh, and um, supply and generation um, elements um, that also need to be considered. Um, so I think. Uh, in terms of um, uh, a uh, kind of a whole electricity system PPA, um, I think that that needs uh, you know proper industry collaboration across multiple parties to really bring that to the forefront. But but I think um, uh, you're completely right in in saying that's that's really um, uh, the area that we need to need to go is that um, we need to. Uh, I think we've started seeing um, a, a bit of a clearer hand from the network operators. Um, and the system operator about what the potential for flexibility is and, and how those markets can be accessed. I think that the the next part is to bring that all together into a provision for the customer, uh, and that's perhaps where you know some further work needed for this year. I mean, in some ways, what what one could be looking at is almost a bit of sort of plug and play, um, because actually the complexity is sitting behind in some ways the market rather than in front of it and i think that when you start to look at all these different markets and all these revenue stacks for anybody other than the most uh, super sophisticated energy experts that accessibility then starts to become very salami sliced really doesn't it yes uh, and certainly um uh, we're very much working towards um uh, the ability to to have uh, assets uh, kind of pre-qualified um, uh, outside of having to actually interact with the network operator um, so that we can see that the um, assets are able to provide a, a particular provision and then plugging into um, any of the flexibility provision that we make, um, like you say, should be kind of behind the scenes and, um, you know, between the B2B element rather than directly impacting on, on, the, on the customer. Yeah. And Randolph, I'm sure you have thoughts about this. I've always um, been excited by um, prices to devices, even, which um, then bypasses so many different people within the uh, within the process. But just update us on where we are with this sort of 
common contract, this common accessibility of flexibility. We've got to make it much more sort of consumer, um, consumer simple in many ways. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, Laura. I like prices to devices as well. Um, and we could we could go on about digitalization and how that will uh, enable that, but maybe that's one for another session. Uh, but in terms of the um, common flexibility contract, so we have a common contract for DSO flexibility services with the six GB DNOs. I was speaking with um, my Northern Ireland colleagues this morning. They're looking at using it as well. Uh, we've gone through a couple of iterations of that based on feedback from SAFECOM. We are launching version 1.2 of that this month, if, if it hasn't gone out already. Um, and then the next stages on that uh, this year in the Open Networks project is to look at incorporating the ESO element, so the, mm -hmm. the transmission element as well, because it's only DSO focused at the moment. So that all sort of tick off the DSO flex, the ESO flex, but like Ben said, and yourself, there's still other elements there that might need to be incorporated um, in terms of like your whole systems flexibility PPA. For example, we're not looking at the energy aspect of it. Well, I think it's something that once we've started to get a stake in the ground, which is what you're doing with your flexibility agreement, it's about then building on that and, and making it much more of a sort of turnkey um, contractual relationship. Yeah, and, and it's a learning process for us. You know, we, we've gone through a few iterations and I'm sure there's going to be many more iterations to make it easier to read, more accessible. So we're going to bring this wonderful webinar to an end, but I wanted to ask you each of you a question and I'll start with Randolph, right? And that is in four or five years time, I mean, I believe we're seeing a huge acceleration of change, right? In four or five years time, where do you want and where do you expect the flexibility, the domestic flexibility market to be? Yeah, so from my perspective, I think basically we want customers participating in a range of different markets, a range of different flex flexibility markets. They could be local DNO, national um, ESO markets, you know, wholesale energy trading but actually they won't really know about any of it. There'll be some sort of digital service provider, could be Julian or it could be others that basically take all that trading complexity for them. And all they have to do is say what their, let's say their minimum comfort levels are for their home. And then all of the trading and maximizing their profits and minimizing their costs is done behind digitally and in an automated way without the customer even knowing about it. I mean, I've always been surprised that the sector wants to engage with customers, what they want them to turn into heating engineers or a electrical yes. power surge experts. Um, and what in many ways, what we've lacked is sophisticated um, service providers at that consumer end. Um, yeah. Julian, in response to that, you are proposed to be a sophisticated service provider here. So, so where, do you, where do you see the market in three to four years time? I, I think because, um, Randolph, thank you, we do, we do do that. The consumer has to do nothing. They, exactly. they don't have any behavior change and the sophisticated technology is good for, good for the home, good for the grid. And I believe it's because it's actually cheaper for a consumer to purchase. So it's, a, it's now becoming cheaper to do that than buy off the grid um, and people talk. They're also the sentiment of going green. It, it's the natural model. So I'm very confident that where I want it to be is where it will be within three or four years. Some other competitors will join us very soon. Um, and like I say, when it becomes a proper sector, it will actually be easier for us. It's quite hard when you're the um, the only viable proposition in town. So you've not heard him. Petition, come on, come on, guys, catch up, please. Now that's a very unusual thing to say, but okay. So Julian is looking for some people on this call to come up and 
and challenge him. Um, Fraser, your vision for, for transportation in three to four years' time? Yeah, I, I, it's probably sort of similar to the, the comments that have just been made there. I'll, although, I'll, I'll just roll back a little bit. The, the conversation where people really are getting too much information, they don't need it, it's going to happen naturally. The, we're in a world where everybody wants to know about everything. And they're so, you know, people and the next generation coming through, yes, they want to, how cheap is it, the, the, the best deal they can get. But they are very socially conscious of how we've managed to get to that. So I think there, people do want to know, uh, you know, some of the details behind it. But as far as transportation, it's as simple for me. I just want to have uh, transportation moved around the city, the, the, the country, Scotland, uh, in a eco-friendly way, whether that's in electric vehicles, and try and avoid uh, fossil fuels. This is the bottom line is I, I try and make sure we've got as much renewables, uh, whether that's the whatever source that might be in the future, and whether it's not even electric, we're moving, looking at hydrogen now. Um, so there's, there, you know, that moves at another stage on to something else. But in the bottom line is, we want to make sure that, as far as I'm concerned, the transportation is moved around my country uh, it, 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 using renewable energy. Simple as that. Well, that is pretty clear and um, very impressive what you've been able to achieve. Ben, what's your vision for the future? So, so I think I think we're in a really good place at the moment that we seem to be having a, a bit of a, um, um, a convergence of, of the technology, the right uh, policy instruments, the right uh, mechanisms w within the industry to, to make this all, all work. Um, so we're really just looking for, for uptake. Uh, I think my only um, uh, additional thing to, to add on to that it, it is rounding back on, on some of the discussions earlier we had about not leaving people behind as well. So there are other sort of things that we really should be doing um, to try and engage on um, energy efficiency measures that you know can be used instead of flexibility uh, and perhaps um, yeah, uh, educating and supporting some of the uh, particularly fuel poor and vulnerable customers so that it's not reducing their consumption or changing their uh, behavior, it, we can allow flexibility to actually increase their consumption in some particular parts and, and helpfully increase their comfort as well. So, you know, if we design things in such a way that it does provide a bit of a safety net and, um, you know, uh, enables both the people who want to be active and participate and do all the whizzy things, but but also perhaps, um, you know, support the, the people um, who are uh, towards the back end of that spectrum. Uh, I think that would be really, you know, that, that is success to me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think picking up on Chi's first point is we are running out of time, um, not just on this webinar, but we are running out of time on climate too. And so I think that we all have incumbent, very much as Fraser, who's very passionate about uh, climate change, as we all are, but um, is that we cannot hold back. And it is all about scale, deployment and action. And I have to say, I think the industry has come so far in the last uh, four to five years, but I think we even need to put a bit more foot on um, one of Fraser's EV cars uh, on the accelerator. So my challenge to everyone is we need to move on, move up and scale up. Um, but I think this is a very exciting part of the agenda and where consumers will start to see some real benefits. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to the ENA, uh, to Chi, a former colleague of mine, and also to our great participants. We've had fantastic questions, which will all be captured. And um, I understand that both the video of this conference and also um, the slides will be made available to everybody who's registered. So I wanted to say a huge thank you to my great panel and thank you to Randolph, Chi and the team. So goodbye and have a good afternoon. Thanks, everyone, for joining.